Okay, so, hello everyone. It's a little weird, actually, because I'm speaking to an empty conference room in Warsaw DC office. So, <laughs> it's the first time I'm doing this like this. Like this. Um, and uh, today, I'm going to go with uh, Channel Me Up Django, which is kind of a very, very bad reference to Star Trek, obviously. So, yeah, this whole presentation is going to be uh, filled with very, very bad references and uh, metaphors. So, uh, let's start. So, first, who am I? Uh, because I think not everybody knows me. Um, like I said, my name is Rado uh, Bozoka, or Rado for short, and uh, I'm a Python engineer from Wrocław, uh, software Poland. Uh, with recently, oh sorry, with recently uh, found love for front-end technologies, which I ignored for a long time, and I'm trying to get to know as much about machine learning as I can, although it's gone pretty slow, and uh, I'm kind of a noob here, so. Mm -hmm. But this presentation isn't going to be about machine learning anyway, so uh, this should be okay. Uh, this presentation is actually going to be about Django and, uh, and bidirectional communication in Django. So we all know Django is awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, it may be a little slow sometimes, but uh, it's, it's totally uh, awesome framework that allows us to build applications really, really fast and uh, has great community, great uh, set of libraries around it. But it, it's got one problem. Uh, it's actually bound to this pull get map model. Yeah, it's request based. So user sends requests, uh, we invoke some view, we send the response. That's all. We cannot do anything more actually. And well, more and more, we need to use some kind of uh, better way to communicate with user some server push, for example, so we can send messages to the user even though they didn't actually ask for them. <laughs> so um, we can communicate uh, anything that changes in our, uh, in our application to them. So what can we do to actually mitigate this? Um, Oh, by the way, uh, I've put this great diagram here. So, uh, like, this shows the HTTP2 utilization in uh, across the internet. So, as you can see, the number of, of uh, web services, web pages that use HTTP2 grows. So, uh, it's pretty much linear growth, uh, but it's almost 15% now of internet using HTTP2. So, uh, we want to be able to use HTTP2 in Django as well, yeah. Um, so, ta -da! Django channels is the answer to, to all the problems I've just stated. Yeah, you can imagine now like the music from the beginning of Star Wars playing, yeah, so uh, that's actually what should be here, but I'm unable to, to put it into this PDF. So you need to just imagine it. So we're gonna tell a little bit about this this library Django channels and uh, what does it give us how to write code in it uh, actually using it and uh, how to deploy this to production so Django channels for now uh, it can give us uh, support for web sockets for example for HTTP long pulling which is like uh, everybody knows what, what HTTP long pooling is? I think so, yes. Okay. Mm. And for HTTP2, including the push uh, technology, so we don't have to even use WebSockets. Although we do. Uh, it's going to be a little bit later explained. Um, also, if you need some other protocol or some other way of, uh, of getting the events to the system, it's totally extendable. It's open source project, obviously. So if you, for example, need WebRTC, just feel free to, to like, write it yourself and, and go with it. 
uh, us. This, there was supposed to be live application, but due to connectivity problems on my laptop, it's not live yet. Uh, so I guess we're going to have to go without it. Um, the code of this application is going to be shown in this presentation. Uh, and uh, it's going to be later put on GitHub as well, so you can check it out for reference. Um, I'm really sorry for this not working. I'm solely uh, angry at the network here at Rotterdam DC and my laptop, but, well, what can you do, yeah? So, first of all, let's explain some... Uh, ah, sorry, this, this application was also meant for you to ask questions during the presentation so we can answer them uh, later. So. If you got some questions, let's keep it for the end of the presentation, okay? Thanks. Okay, so first, we need to understand a few core concepts of, uh, of channels. So what actually is a channel? Channel is just a data structure. So it's just a first in, first out queue uh, that's gonna store some messages. But there's two little twists. Uh, so, first of all, we've got message expiring. Uh, if a message is going to sit in a channel for uh, for too long time, it's just going to get dropped. It's not going to get delivered to the other end of the queue. And uh, we've also got at most once delivery. So, obviously, in a consumer-producer model, yeah, we can have multiple consumers. And channels make sure, make sure for us that only one, at most one, of those consumers get the message. So it's not like we are totally sure that the message gets through. That's our work to do, to make sure. Uh, but if it gets through, uh, we are sure that only one consumer gonna get, uh, get called and, uh, and we're not gonna have some weird side effects uh, from two consumers actually fighting over a message or something. So basically, you can imagine a channel to be like a uh, mama bird that feeds its, uh, its younglings with the worms. Yes. So in this example, in this metaphor, the worm is a message, the mama bird is a producer, and the baby birds are the consumers. So, well, obviously, only one baby bird can um, can eat the worm. Yeah. So. That's our uh, at most once delivery, and if all the baby birds are uh, busy with uh, with eating other birds, then mama bird is just gonna consume the bird, uh, the, the worm, and and the message won't get uh, through. This is expiry time. Yeah, so we can think about like this. But there's one more concept that makes this whole metaphor not very valuable, and this is channel groups. So. Uh, Basically, it may come in handy to send the same message to uh, multiple consumers. Oh, sorry, to, to multi, yeah, to multiple channels, uh, and we can do that very easily, which I'm gonna show in a second. Uh, so we got those channel groups, and uh, we can just send message to the group, which gonna take care of sending the message to every channel in a group. So this is also like. Uh, out of the box. Okay, a few more core concepts. We got interface and worker servers, this division. We've got channels backend, ASGI, consumers and routing. And I'm going to show it uh, using this handy diagram here. So, basically, um, what is, what is uh, channels doing for us? It's splitting Django into kind of two processes, two sets of processes. One set is interface servers. Those are the servers that are facing outwards. They're uh, accepting the requests from a uh, user browser. Uh, this can be HTTP, WebSocket, or whatever we really want. Um, and then at the bottom, those three, they are residing on one of multiple, probably, worker servers. So worker server is actually taking care of processing the request. So why do we even need interface server? Because it, based on routing, it can send the messages to different consumers. 
yeah, if we got uh, uh, some routing specified, it can say that HTTP methods, HTTP messages should go to this consumer, while WebSocket messages can go to another consumer. Uh, interface server to consumer to worker server to consumers communication is done actually using the channels backend and ASGI. ASGI stands for Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface. So I'm going to talk about it later as well. Uh, just to let you know, initially, uh, like it's meant to replace WSGI, uh, which we usually uh, use to communicate the, let's say, interface server with the with the Django application. Yeah. Uh, so does this seem clear to you? Guys? Okay, silence is usually meant to, to, to mean yes. So I'm, I'm assuming that everything here is clear and we can move forward. So now we can show some code examples. And this is actual code like partially taken from the channels, uh, channels documentation page, partially uh, the code I've written for this live application that isn't live. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to show you how actually uh, it's possible to write in like, I don't know, two hours, a functioning uh, WebSocket chat. Uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, we need to configure the channels. And as you can see, we uh, should add in settings by uh, channel layers uh, constant. That's a dict. It's, it's a bit similar to databases, and every key de describes backend, um, de describes a layer, sorry. Uh, the layer has a backend. For now, we're going to use the in memory backend. Uh, it's going to uh, allow us to, to share the messages between the interface server and worker server uh, in the same process. Uh, it's in memory, yeah. And we've also got to specify the routing. How the routing looks like, I'm going to show in a second. Um, so basically, this uh, routing will just point to, uh, to a variable in our application that will describe uh, how we should divide the messages between consumers. OK, now let's write some consumers, OK? Um, as you can see, we have to import channels, yeah? Uh, this message import, uh, this message model, this is something uh, custom I wrote. And let's see what happens there. Uh, we've got um, two interesting things here. One thing is usage of group. So uh, like I uh, told you before, we've got this concept of channels grouping. And, uh, and it's really that simple uh, that we just have a group, we can get a group by its name, which is an ordinary string, and we can just add uh, a channel to it with another method. And second thing is this reply channel. What is it actually? So every message we're going to get uh, is going to have this, uh, this attribute, reply channel. Uh, basically, it's just so we know uh, where to send the response for this message, yeah? So as you can see, we are uh, sending message uh, to, to, to the reply channel. We are sending the accept true. So we're telling the user, yeah, I accept you. I accept your connection. And uh, the second consumer is, uh, is also pretty intuitive. So it just takes the group and it uh, says, OK, if there's the reply channel, the, uh, the user that sent this message is, um, is disconnecting, then let's just discard it. We don't need to send messages to him uh, or her. We don't want it to not clutter our channels. Uh, so one interesting thing you can see here is that the reply channel gets, uh, uh, gets kind of like remembered uh, by, by, the, by the channels themselves. So, uh, so we, we don't actually uh, like care about seeking for the reply channel. We don't have to store it anyway. Uh, 
it's bound to user in a way. So uh, every time you got this reply channel, this is the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So and to 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 finalize with the consumers, we just need to like write a consumer that's gonna actually do the chat work. Yeah. Uh, and it's just going to accept the message and then we send it to every user in the group, if every channel in a group. Uh, so as you can see, I just create uh, some message model and uh, I just uh, send the message to the whole group. Um, why is this fun? Because this is like very, very simplistic approach here. Yeah. Uh, just get the message, send it outwards, uh, broadcast it. But we can do much more with it. Um, this send message instruction, this, can, this uh, doesn't have to be the last line in the consumer. So, for example, uh, I could just like create this message, send it outwards, and only then save it. Uh, if I, for example, accept an image from a user, uh, then I can send him, okay, I, I, I've got your image, and then generate a thumbnail. So I'm not bound to this, uh, to this model of having to return request, uh, so, sorry, return response, yeah, HTTP response. I, I can send this message uh, to the whole group or just to the reply channel at any time and can continue doing whatever I want. Okay, so like I said, routing, yeah, this, uh, this little thing here, this uh, five liner, this is going to uh, actually route the messages to consumers. And uh, as you can see, this is very similar to uh, how the URLs uh, look in a regular Django application, yeah. So we just got this root function that's going to create a root for us. And uh, We've got uh, three channels here uh, that are mm, like typical use, uh, typical channels for WebSockets. If something comes to WebSocket Connect, we do the, con the WS join here. So we just accept the user and add him to the group. If anybody sends something to WebSocket Receive, we've got this one, WS message. Uh, so we just send a message uh, to the whole group. And if something happens, like uh, the connection breaks, the user disconnects, the user closes the tab in the browser or our server fails uh, for some reason, uh, anything that happens uh, that causes the disconnect of, disconnect of a WebSocket results in calling WS leave, which will just remove the user from the, uh, from the group. So, like, we can see how many lines do we have here? Okay, channel layers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Consumers, 10, 11, 13, 15, uh, 20, 27 lines. So this 27 lines is totally working application that's going to accept uh, the WebSocket uh, traffic uh, and, uh, and create this group chat. 27 lines, so that's like, wow. This is, this is the thing you can write in, uh, let's say, without the knowledge of the channels, actually, in, let's say, hour and a half. So you see how awesome this is. OK, but I was talking about the. Uh, the WebSocket requests. So what happens to HTTP requests? Yeah. Um, channels does it uh, has it covered for you. So basically, we've got this HTTP dot request channel, which uh, accepts the HTTP traffic. So for example, if you want the hello world, you can just write this, uh, let's say six liner. Yeah. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, we are accepting some message again. This is uh, not really a, a, a request. So we just create uh, an HTTP response that says, hello world, 
and we can send it to ASGI handler, uh, which also channel like has this implementation for us. And this is in the root, just another line, HTTP.request, HTTP consumer. Yeah, so we bind this, uh, this root with the consumer. And actually all of uh, what I said right now, this is true, but also you don't need this knowledge. You know why? Because Django channels actually does it for you. So uh, if you got a regular Django application and just add a channel layer on top of it, you don't have to add HTTP.request channel anywhere in the routing because the default uh, implementation of Django channels just gonna every just gonna process every HTTP message in the way that will it will just uh, throw it into the view of your choice, like to the regular Django application. You don't even need to write this thing. Okay, um, also something useful. So we can use channels for authentication mm -hmm. with web sockets, with HTTP. So if we want to have a session, no problem, channels got it covered. Um, we've got, uh, for example, here is an example of having uh, chat rooms that are uh, based on the path yeah, so if you just connect you know, uh, using WebSockets uh, to certain path, every path is going to be uh, another chat room. It's going to create another group. We've got it in line uh, four of WS Connect, and it is going to communicate you just with people in this very room. Uh, okay. And as you can see, we've got this handy dec decorator, channel session. Mm. So maybe we've got other decorators. Because channel session, uh, this is uh, the session we, we like keep uh, on a channel to, that uses, for example, WebSockets. Uh, why do we need that, actually? Uh, because um, the information about user uh, are sent only on WS Connect. So in WS Message, uh, we would have like no way of knowing uh, about the user. So we can do this just using this channel session. Yeah, we uh, this decorator will uh, save the user data in this in the session in this channel, as you can see, message channel session, uh, and then we can retrieve it using the same very the very same decorator in WS Message. Um, okay, what other decorators here do we have? So we've got HTTP session that's going to give us message HTTP session. So it's like regular uh, session we are uh, used to in Django. Yeah, this can be cookie based, this can be some token based session. We don't care. Uh, it works with both. Um, we can also have information about the user. So we can have message user using this HTTP session user decorator. And finally, we got the creme de la creme of, uh, of the session usage with, with channels. We've got channel session user from HTTP. So it's automatically, automatically, I would say, stores user and session information in both HTTP and channel session. So basically, we've got the authentication between HTTP and WebSocket covered for us. Um, Okay, I've talked about backends, as you remember, probably, we've got this in-memory backends, yeah? So, uh, this is cool, this is cool, really, we can make the interface server and web and worker server uh, that are running in the same process communicate using this in-memory channel. So, as you can see, this obviously is a problem, yeah, because this doesn't seem really production ready, uh, especially if we want to, for example, scale just worker servers uh, and have, I don't know, one or two interface servers. So how do they communicate? Well, they communicate using backend, just different one. Uh, so we can have, uh, we've got several backends available out of the box. 
we've got Redis, we've got uh, Redis with sharding, we've got even IPC, and it's easily extendable. So mm, you don't have to have much knowledge uh, about how channels work, uh, just the backend part, and you're all set. You, you want to use, I don't know, uh, Postgres, which seems unreasonable, just go with it, write it, and uh, and uh, show it on GitHub or something. Um, okay, so now we're going to go to running this application and uh, how to do it locally and how to do it uh, in production. So we're all used to managed by run server, yeah, which spawns a uh, development server on our local machine so we can see the application uh, locally. And this works with, uh, with Django channels. This works kind of like, like usual, like we're used to. So it's going to spawn just one process on our machine uh, that we're going to see all the logs there. But this process is going to be actually multi-threaded. Uh, because it's going to span both interface and worker servers in one process. So this is when, when we can use this in-memory backend, yeah? When we got those threads, we can just use this backend uh, for them to communicate. So uh, let's see how we can do this with Redis to enable, for now, just local solution, but it's going to be pretty obvious how to uh, move it to, like, separate machines. So first of all, we're going to need to change a little bit uh, layer configuration. Uh, there's this package, ASGI Redis. Uh, so let's install it and use Redis channel layer. Uh, this is going to be our backend. We can show it where the Redis is actually uh, storing information. So in this example, it's just in local host, but it can be anything. It can be any URI you can think of. Where do you keep your Redis, whatever. Uh, the routing, uh, the routing line actually doesn't change. Uh, we still want to use the, the routing we wrote before. We don't have to change anything. Okay. So we've got this configuration. And let's run it into different terminals. Uh, so as you can see, there, if, uh, there is one additional option that we can give to run server that's called no workers. So this is going to sp spawn in this process just interface servers. We don't have worker servers in the same pool. We just have an interface uh, that's going to communicate with workers using this Redis. And we've got an uh, additional comment that channels adds to manage Pi for us. This is run workers. So this will spawn, obviously, just the uh, worker, uh, just the worker servers. OK, we can do even more. Uh, if we want to scale workers, for example, we can, for example, uh, say, OK, on this very machine, in this process, run just the workers that are HTTP, uh, that, uh, that are listening on HTTP channels. Yeah, so as you can see, we've got this option, only channels equals HTTP dot star. Uh, so this is going to spam the workers that's just going uh, to they don't even listen to the, for example, WebSocket channels. Uh, we can also exclude, for example, single channel or a group of channels. So this is um, pretty much everything we need. We can uh, even combine the two and give it only channels something, but exclude something else. Um, OK, so how to move it to production? Um, I've talked uh, about S ASGI, yes, so usually we uh, run something like UWSGI or Unicorn and configure it to communicate with our application. Uh, so, well, uh, Channels team got us covered and they created something they call Daphne. Uh, th this is open source ASGI server. Uh, so um, we can use it almost the way we would use a uh, regular WSGI setup uh, with Django. And Daphne is well, still, still in development. It's pretty stable. The current version is 1.2. And uh, you can use it. 
there is one problem. It supports WebSockets, it supports HTTP, and it supports HTTP2 without push technology. And when I read about it, I was like, really? Guys, this is the exact thing we want here. <laughs> um, so uh, if you're interested in Daphne a little bit more, uh, you can find it on GitHub. If you want, you can uh, add your pull request, uh, help the guys bring the HTTP2 push uh, to to life, uh, and I encourage you to do so because I'm I'm like very busy, cannot do this, and <laughs> and really want to see it happening. Um, okay, so how to configure Daphne to run our application? First of all, we uh, create a file called asgi.py, and this is very similar to wsgi.py. Uh, and it should live in the same directory. Uh, to, this is like the best practice, yeah? So, as you can see, we just need to tell it where the settings module is and tell it uh, to get channel layer. This is all. We don't even have to, um, uh, to like prepare this WSGI application class or whatever, because channels got us covered. And to run Daphne, uh, you just uh, give it the, the binding IP address, the port it should listen on, and the uh, actual ASGI app uh, that you want. So this is going to be my project.asgi and channel layer in this example. So this is pretty straightforward, yeah? This is even easier than configuring, I don't know, Nginx with UWSGI. Yeah, and that's pretty much it, what I had to, to tell you. I'm really sorry for uh, not having this live application up and running. Uh, so you had to, to, to like keep all your questions in your mind. And if you, if you got any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them now. I, I, I've got one question. Uh, there is practice to use uh, Django and um, Tornado together uh, to handle with uh, uh, ch uh, charts and so on. I is it true, uh, if uh, I understand well, that uh, Django ch channel uh, uh, replaces uh, Tornado and uh, there is no need to use Tornado? Uh, actually, this is partially true. So, Daphne is written using uh, Twisted Tornado, as far as I remember. And it's, it's really pretty fast. Um, so many configuration options that you can give to Daphne is actually uh, based on, on some uh, twisted tornado settings. And uh, it should probably uh, easily solve the, uh, the 10K problem. Um, because like, if you just want the worker server for, for example, WebSockets, this won't even run the whole uh, Django application, all your views and stuff. Uh, Daphne is going to just redirect it to this worker. Yeah, so uh, as far as I understand how Daphne works, uh, this is true, yeah? Don't need it. Thank you. 